Hi and welcome everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to Artificial Intelligence as a Partner in the Learning Process. Um, my name is Sochil Tirado. I am a faculty mentor with CVC and the Distance Education Coordinator at Imperial Valley College. Before we begin, I would like everyone to know that we have two sign language interpreters in our meeting. They are Jocelyn and Steven. I am now pleased to introduce you to our wonderful facilitator, Christella Button. Christella is a former secondary English ESL teacher and PK-12 instructor, instructional coach. She now works at Diablo, Diablo Valley College as an instructional designer and computer information science instructor. Her focus on online accessibility and equitable course design allows her to support instructors as they create innovative and inclusive learning spaces in all modalities. She finds teaching to be an awesome adventure, helping her put her work's focus into practice and reminding her that there is always something to learn, even if you are the teacher. During the webinar, we will also be linking to a survey for you to provide feedback We'll be dropping a link in the chat at 30 minutes and then every 15 minutes after that, we ask that you fill this out to let us know how we did and so we can create programming that is more tailored to the needs of our system moving forward. Lastly, while At One offers badges as proof of completion for our courses, we do not provide a badge for attending this webinar. However, if your institution does require proof of attendance for flex credit or professional advancement, Please remain until the end of the webinar, complete the survey, and request a copy of your response to be sent to you through the Google form. You can use that confirmation as your proof of attendance. And now, without further ado, I uh, turn it over to Christella. Um, and thank you very much for joining me on a Friday morning. Um, I'm Christella Button. My pronouns are she, her. And as mentioned, I work at Diablo Valley College as an instructional designer. I'm excited to be here today and share some of my experience uh, with AI and then get a little bit more information around AI um, for all of you today. So I did put a link to the slides in the chat. And as people join late, um, if you see anybody looking for it, if you don't mind sharing it with them, that would be great. Yes, I'll take care of that. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. So we will have time for questions at the end, and I'm sure this is a topic where there will be quite a few thoughts, questions, um, wanting to know more about it. So we'll make time for that. Uh, but today we are learning about AI as a partner in our learning process. So we'll define a little bit more about what I mean by that, but really we're looking for AI as a tool to help learning happen not necessarily produce learning. So um, you know a little bit about me, but a little bit more. Uh, so I am, like I mentioned, currently an instructional designer. I also teach in our computer information systems um, department. Uh, former high school teacher, and I spent most of my time in English ESL and theater, uh, but also have quite a passion for Google. So I am a Google certified trainer and educator. Um, and that is what sort of brought me into the work that I do today and also has lent a little bit to my learning of AI as Google has their own AI bot. Uh, and so maybe we'll learn a little bit about that today too. Uh, what I love most about course design is accessibility and equitable design for learning. Um, and I do focus mostly on online learning, but also I'm here to support face-to-face, -face, hybrid, all kinds of modalities for learning. Um, as we learn about integrating technology and then releasing some of that traditional load of uh, maybe the sage on the stage versus the guide on the side. So becoming that teacher who guides on the side using technology, um, sometimes innovative technology such as AI as well. Um, so if you would like to participate, I know we're going to be kind of a big crowd today, but if you want to um, send out some reactions, those are always helpful. So I know how things are going, um, but also leverage the chat. I would love for you to ask questions or help each other learn a little bit more as that we create our learning community here. Um, we will have time for a Q&A towards the end. 
Um, so if you have thoughts and you just don't want to forget what it is, drop it in the chat and then we'll come back to it later. Or maybe you can help each other through that community conversation in there as well. So we'll start today with what is AI? Because it's still fairly new for a lot of us and myself included. And so we'll get a basic understanding of what is AI? How does AI connect with equity and accessibility? Um, and then what are some of those expectations and implementation styles or cues that we might have as we're learning with AI? We'll get some time to talk about creating a syllabus statement around the use of AI and possible classroom activities where you could incorporate um, or support the use of AI as well. And then lastly, we'll talk about those limitations that AI and other software do have. Um, and what's some just to stay and then have time for our QA. Christella, it's a little bit hard to hear you. Sometimes it gets distorted. So I don't know mm -hmm. if turning off your uh, camera may help. Yes, let me do that. Let's try that. Thank that you. We'll make it through having some technical difficulties today, but we all know how that goes. Um, so what are we here to learn? Obviously, we're learning about AI, but I wanted us to create focus around the community that we are building today. We are here to learn and understand a little bit more about AI. We're here to keep a growth mindset and know that there's more to learn. There's always something new with technology and we can always learn a little bit more and move forward. We're here to adjust and work with AI because we know that it's here and it's likely not leaving. So we want to learn how can we make it a part of our process? How can we allow it to be something that is supportive of us? And then be positive. We wanna be positive as we are supporting each other. We may all be in different spaces of learning. Some of us may know a little bit more about AI than others. And some of us may uh, be a little bit more worried about AI than others. And we wanna be respectful of that, be positive and support each other as we're putting thoughts forward in the chat or we're unmuting and sharing ideas. Ultimately, we are here to support students wherever they need with whatever they need. Um, and so we'll keep that in mind as we talk about AI today. It's all about student success in the end. And then lastly, we're building our own digital literacy so that we can support the digital literacy of our students. Um, so we're learning more, we are applying more, and we are doing more. Okay. So what is AI? Um, let's start with a basic introduction. AI, otherwise known as artificial intelligence, is a, in, the, in this case, we're talking about generative AI, which is a type of AI that generates new content in response to a prompt or question or something that you ask it. So it takes what it knows based on all the information it has collected and gives you a response that it thinks is most applicable to whatever you're asking. They're also called large language models, LLMs. Um, and that would be something like chat GPT, which is probably the most popular perplexity, Google Gemini, which used to be called Google Bard. But all of those programs, they take things that are familiar. So language structure, grammar, content, um, public knowledge, and they sort of train themselves to compile that information and to give you a response based on a pattern that it creates and recognizes. So really, it's all about pattern learning. And it just repeats the pattern to you. And it gets better and more responsive the more that you use it. So I wanted to provide you a few links to tools. Um, so if you've got the presentation open, you, you have access to these links. If you're totally new, these are ones that we suggest you might try. Um, Perplexity AI is a favorite, especially of the English department and social science departments at DVC, um, because it does actually give you citations for what it generates. Um, so if you're looking for like a particular you know, response to a question, it will provide citations for where it gets that information from. ChatGPT is the most popular, I would say, likely because it was like one of those first ones to kind of get out there. Um, but it, uh, it, it's 
One that also our faculty and staff use a lot of too, there is a paid version as well as a freed version, um, but it is it does not provide those citations. So sometimes you don't know what you're getting. Um, Google Gemini, I have fun playing with it, but it is still very new. And so it does sometimes not produce what you're looking for. Um, at the time that I typed this, it did require permission to sign up. I don't know if that's true anymore or not. Things change very quickly. Um, so you might want to double check on that one. Um, and doll E2 is a prompt that will turn into an art or image or graphic that you ask it to create. Um, you can see the images in this presentation. I actually used Canva's magic image creator, which is their AI image creator. Uh, but doll E2 functions very similarly. Um, and there are so many more that I actually just linked an article that has quite a few of them on there as well. If you have any more that you want to recommend, feel free to put them in the chat and add to the list. Um, so we want to start with equity and accessibility in the forefront of new technology. And those of you who have attended anything that I've done in the past, you'll know that this is where we always start because this is the best place for us to understand what our students need and how we can move forward and support them. Uh, so what are the ethical implications of AI use? There are quite a few and we've linked some information here for you, but we wanna start with the lack of transparency. It's not always clear especially to new users or people who are not um, very digitally literate, that this is not a human response. This is not information that may or may not be correct. We don't know exactly where this information is coming from. So we really wanna be clear and transparent with our students um, that that is what uh, AI is and does. There is a natural bias to AI as they are created by humans. And so those humans who've created it instill their own biases, discriminatory practices, systemic issues into this technology. So we wanna acknowledge that sometimes this can be biased technology. As you're using it to create responses or find images, build images, those kinds of things, keep in mind what you're getting in response. Is it eliminating uh, minoritized groups in its response? Is it allowing you to create diverse images? Or is it giving you what it thinks you want, the pattern that it's been um, created with bias to create? And then we also consider the privacy implications, especially if we're asking students to use uh, AI or to uh, interact with AI. What are those privacy implications who is collecting this information? If they're putting in um, you know, personally written works, that stuff is collected into these kinds of systems um, and they use it in their patterns. So how are we being aware of that and how are we letting our students be aware of these privacy implications with AI use? Um, and then the last note here, using AI as a TA. It is great to support menial workload. So if you are writing like a course summary to bring to you know, your academic setting meeting or whatever you're doing, that's a great menial task where AI can support you. But it is not a space where we can really look for genuine student feedback. So if we are looking for something that can help us write detailed student feedback, that's what we do best. We know our students and we know what they need. We can use AI to help support those kinds of things, but we're really looking for personal connection and community building with students. So we don't want AI to come in the way uh, and take that away from us. As far as accessibility, the last time I, I had done a presentation on AI, somebody asked a great question. Well, can it help me write my alt text or can it help me caption videos? That would be great, <laughs> but at this point in time, it does not offer that capability. So right now, um, I have tried with a few different ones to describe an image and ask it to give me some alt text, and it comes up with something way out there that is absolutely not related. It doesn't have the ability to look at your image and create alt text. So that is still something that you will want to take care of yourself. It also cannot caption videos doesn't have the ability to take a look at your outside media 
and make it accessible for you. So that's something you'll still need to work into your process as you are creating and building your own course materials. Um, and we wanna think in terms of same access, not alternate access. So how are we using, if we are using AI, so that our students have the same access regardless of their ability? Um, if you're asking AI to generate a transcript, which is a great use of AI, how is that original material also available to students with disabilities? Is it edited? Have you gone through and make sure that it is connected and it is the correct information? So we just wanna give ourselves that extra check to make sure our students are getting at the same access regardless of their ability. Okay. Uh, so things that we can do to ensure equity as we use AI, we can ensure digital equity. Those of us who are teaching, no matter the modality, know that we're using technology in all spaces now. So how can we ensure digital equity um, and let students know how and when to use AI or when not to, so that they are ready and prepared to be um, as successful in your course as possible. We can ensure a more inclusive practice where we allow students to explore AI in a safe place and give them the outlines that they need to follow so that they're learning how to use it and they're preparing for their life outside of the college community. Um, and then how can we ensure accessible spaces? Use AI to ask for perspective on how to make something more accessible. If you are building a, a poster session and you have like an end of year um, showcase, ask AI how you might set up that space to make it more accessible for all people to attend. Think about accessibility as you use AI and how can you ask it to support you? So we have a lot of feelings about this. New technology can be really scary, especially when you don't know how to use it. I mean, I, I still have not mastered AI. It's so new. It can be really scary and it can be scary to try it in front of people, in front of peers, in front of students and not know what's gonna happen. And so I just wanna acknowledge that because it is scary and it sometimes cannot do what we want it to do. And then that makes us feel a little bit less, right? Um, so we need to learn how to leverage it. Even if we don't love it, we're here to learn how to leverage it and make it help us do what we need to do. Help to create an engaging environment with authentic learning so that we can prepare our students for success outside of community college. And our focus today, in case you haven't noticed, because I've said it four or five times now, is transparency around your expectations. We are going to learn a little bit more about what it takes to create um, your own thoughts, your own feelings around this technology, around its use, so that you can tell your students honestly, tell your faculty, tell your staff, this is what I expect, this is how and when I want you to use it, um, and then work together to create your own understanding about what that looks like. Um, so a little bit about AI expectations and implementations. Um, it is a process, not a product. And I heard this phrase when I was at OTC last year, so last, um, last June, from Trudy Radke. And they did a beautiful presentation on how AI is a process of learning. It is not just a product creator. It helps support the student, the teacher, whoever is using it through the process of understanding a topic or task. And thinking about it that way made it so much more digestible to me because it wasn't just something that produces a paragraph. It really helped me to understand that this is a stepping stone to learning. This is something that students can use to help them come to a final understanding. Um, students exist in a product-focused a product -focused world. They are so driven by producing something and turning it in and making sure that they get the grade that they want. And that that goes for, you know, workspace too. Like we are timeline driven. We need to have this particular write up done at a particular time so that we can share it here. So it becomes this focus of a product rather than the process. So we wanna go back and think about how can AI assist us in that, pro that process so that we have a more comprehensive product in the end. Um, 
and I talk in terms of Canvas because I do support mostly online classes, but if we think about Canvas or our own Outlook calendars, right, we're encouraged by that to-do list. It gives us the things that we have to do and it chimes when things are due. Um, and then that makes things shift focus away from our process that we could be creating. So we wanna try to help students embrace this as a learning process. And when we talk about authentic assessment, by that I'm meaning creating assessments where students are learning about things that are applicable to the real world. That could be a product that they create, that could be a project that they present, it could be a million different things. We're talking about less of that um, multiple choice uh, assessments and more authentic assessment when I mean, uh, when I say that. So allowing for opportunities for revision, practice, formative assessment, low stakes activities where they can practice their learning. AI is a great thing that we can bring in at that time because it is low stakes learning. We can have our students practice with it, know what it is capable or not capable of, and then they can work with it around it um, under knowing what we expect of them. It can be a really useful tool, especially in that brainstorming phase, um, that thinking process that students are going through um, and, you know, all of the things that come with that. Um, I did link Trudy Radke's presentation there. And if you have a moment of time, they did an amazing job and I would highly recommend taking a look um, at their stuff we got there. Um, so just like backwards ma mapping, make it a part of your process. If you are wanting to build something around AI, let's say you are teaching a unit and you want your students to really learn how to and not to use it, Start thinking about where does it fit in there then? Where does it fit most easily and also with those low stakes so that students can practice and try without the fear of failure? So how do you expect them to use it or not use it? That's something that we need to identify first. How will you use it? And be honest with them about how you use it so that they know that you are also holding yourself to that standard too. And put it in several spaces within your course. If you're teaching online, you have announcements, you have your pages, you have your assignments. If you're teaching face-to-face -face or hybrid, give them an opportunity to talk about it in class too. Remind them at the beginning of the hour and say, you know, we're moving into our AI assignment and I want to remind you that this is my focus, this is my expectation, and then this is what I will be doing with it too. Put it everywhere so that they know and that they are fully aware of your expectations so they know how to be successful. And use it as an opportunity to build digital citizenship within your own class, department, online community, whatever it is that you're sharing AI in. Create a statement and some mini statements that you can partner uh, with the things that you produce. I mean, currently I'm not actually teaching right now, but I'm still doing that in the professional development that I create and share. I still have statements of expectations and I still wanna be transparent with people. What did I create with AI and what did I create without it? You'll notice that every image that I created in here, like I mentioned, was created using Canva's AI. And I put a statement there so that I'm being transparent about where I'm using AI and where I'm not. So you can make that part of your practice so that by the time you get into these spaces where you're doing learning or you're sharing the learning, people know what your expectations are and how you use AI and what you would hope that they do with it as well. Um, oh, and I did, I forgot to put this on here, but you know, sometimes when you say you can't have that cake, you really want it. So if you're going to tell a student, don't use AI and you don't tell them why, sometimes they go, oh, but that sounds really interesting. And now I want to. So giving them the transparent expectation helps alleviate that just a little bit. All right. Um, so that was a lot of information. <laughs> I want to attempt to turn my camera on. I'm really nervous, but I'm going to try. Um, so I want to give us the opportunity to talk about creating a syllabus statement. It is something that likely you've thought about and possibly you've already drafted and maybe you've shared something with your students or your colleagues previous. So if you've already drafted a statement, keep that in mind as we talk about what are some of those elements that are best placed in a statement, help us move our understanding forward and be transparent about our expectations. So the elements of a strong statement around it. Priscilla, is I'm it sorry. 
it yeah it's going back it was perfect when your camera was off I'm so sorry <laughs> okay I'm going off just know that I'm really here I'm really a person here <laughs> I swear um okay so clarity, inclusion, and transparency. Those are three things that we've talked about but are still so paramount to the process. Be very clear. And if you don't know what your expectations are with AI, this is a really great opportunity to figure out what are they? How comfortable am I with AI? If you haven't tried any AI, I really encourage you to do so so that you know where your boundaries are. I was hesitant to use it too, but especially in the space in which I work in and teach in, I really needed to. So I had to get in there and figure out where was I most comfortable. And I made it a conversation with my students to let them know, I am trying it too. I know you want to, and so do it, but here are the things that I wanna make sure that you keep in mind as you do that. Um, and then being really clear about support moments. If students are using it, provide them support. Or if you're asking them to not use it, provide them those, well, what if I think I need to use it? What can I do instead moments? Because what if they feel like that's the only thing? Like they're so late getting this assignment done and they just don't know what to do. I just have to use AI because I have no other options. If you think that that might happen, create a statement around it and put it right on that assignment or share it with your students and say, look, I know you might be thinking AI is the only option right now, but here are other things that you can try or here's how you can reach me for support um, and getting them past those kind of scary moments. And then remind them of already existing policies. You likely already have a campus policy around um, using other people's information or you know, an academic conduct statement of sorts. Leverage the policy that already exists. Um, if that policy outlines plagiarism, then that would fall under AI if, if you're not, if they're not citing. If you want them to cite their AI sources, tell them that, be very transparent. If you're asking them to use AI or you're asking them to not use AI, a great way to monitor both of those things is to ask them to cite their sources appropriately um, and remind them how to do that, of course. Um, and remind them of already existing support spaces. If you have spaces on campus where they can get peer-to-peer -peer support, like we have our academic support center, send them there. If they're in that moment of need, send them there. Send them to your office hours. Or if you know that there are other places where they can get instructor to student support, send them there. Uh, also send them to their basic needs and wellness support because it may just be that they are so bogged down with everything and they don't know where to go and AI feels like the only way out. A little bit of a mention of those basic needs and wellness supports may get them right out of those trenches and right back into that supportive space that they need to be a part of your online community or your in-person community. Just remind them that you are there to support them. There are other supports on campus as well and that they can get what they need to move past their current need. Um, and then give them reminders of those things frequently. I use a lot of announcements in my course. I make a lot of videos. I put a lot of that information in there. And then for those in-person events, just reminding them, you know, at the top of the class or the end of the class, these are ways in which you can get support. Um, if you are offering like drop-in hours, reminding them of when those are, so that they don't feel like they have to figure out all of this stuff by themselves. Um, so I do have a template, which I know the screenshot is not that great and I apologize for that. Uh, but you can kind of see what it looks like built within my course. And what I did for DVC is create a template of this page. So that's why you'll see that a lot of the language has like that blue highlighting. That's more of like where you would add your own thoughts. So I did actually make a Google Doc version of this, and I will put this in the chat so that you can take a look at it. Um, but it is just a template of this exact screenshot that you'll see here that gives you the space to really start to, to produce your own language template. You don't have to use everything in here. Please feel free to uh, make your own copy. You can either download it or make a copy to your own uh, Google Drive to use it if you would like to. Uh, but there's some brainstorming note space as we start talking about and looking at examples today. I wanted to give you some space to write if you would like to write, um, but you'll fill in the blanks where you see those, those brackets and, and things like that. 
Um, so feel free to make a copy or download so that you can use this template if you would like to. And it might be helpful to do that now so that as we go through the rest of the presentation, you have the space to kind of brainstorm and um, keep some ideas together as you move forward and create your own language. Um, so I do want to give us time to brainstorm, and then that will also give me a quick moment to look through the chat. Um, but thinking about your own statement, your own thoughts, your own expectations about AI, first reflect, and you can do so directly on that document if you downloaded it. Otherwise, just take a minute to reflect in your mind, or if you have a piece of paper and you want to write some ideas down, this is a good opportunity to do that as well. But think to yourself, how do you feel about students using AI tools in your classroom? Or if you're not currently teaching at this time, what do you think you feel about that? Um, are there opportunities in your course where you can teach students to use AI tools ethically and responsibly? Uh, what happens if a student does use AI in a tool that violates your college's academic integrity policy? And if you don't know what that is, you should look up your college's academic integrity policy and see what it is. And then where can they find resources to support in, in your course, but also outside of your course too, as, as a whole college community, so they can feel support around using AI um, or not using it. So they don't feel like that's the only way that they can successfully complete an assignment. Let's take about three minutes to kind of get some brainstorming ideas going. And I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at the chat and see if there are any questions. If you have other questions and you want to add them into the chat now, feel free. See, and while people are finishing their brainstorm, I'll just address a couple of the questions. Um, somebody asked me if I have things that I share with my students that I would be willing to share. This is all stuff that I share with my students. Um, and so I'm happy for you to share and use whatever is here. Um, and as far as like handouts and stuff that I would give to my students around it, um, since I don't teach face-to-face, -face, I don't have any like paper handouts. Everything that I build is in Canvas, but um, you know, I, I do find it to be my own personal responsibility as the steward of their learning in my class to be really transparent with them and tell them about all of my ex expectations so that I can lift the burden for them. I don't want them to have to think about, oh, well, what does Professor Button want? Like, what if she doesn't like this? I want to tell them exactly what I want. And so I also show an example every time. So if I'm asking them to do an assignment and I'm asking them, please do not use AI, I'm going to give them everything that they need to be successful to get there. I'm giving them a template. I made a video step-by-step -step of how to do it. I am providing all of the things that, that might cause barriers to them being successful and might ask them to look at AI um, if they feel like they can't be successful. So I'm doing whatever I can, but I'm also being honest with them around that and saying, you know, I don't want you to use AI. And if you feel like you have to, please talk to me about it. And I would rather that you turn something in, you know, half done than fully done with AI and we'll figure something out. Just being a partner for them and being on their team is really helpful. And again, transparency really goes a long way. Um, and I had another question in here. Can I share an assignment? I am going to. So yes, <laughs> that'll be the next little section here. So don't worry. Um, Let's see here. Okay. 
Um, we'll talk a little bit about, there was one question about AI detection and I have thoughts and feelings about that as I'm sure a lot of people do and I'm happy to share mine with you uh, actually a little bit later in this presentation. Um, but it is not something that I will encourage the use of and there are a lot of things that you can do research on around that. And if it's something that you feel like you wanna use, I would really recommend that you um, chat with your academic senate around that and see where they're at. Um, so with that, we'll move to some elements of using AI in the classroom, which I see a few of you have very similar ideas to what I'm going to present right now. So that's great. Uh, so some elements, again, for strong AI activities in the classroom, starting with that clarity, inclusion, and transparency. How are we being very, very clear about our expectations of using AI and not using AI, depending on what activity we're creating? How are we being inclusive of all students, students who may have different cultural experiences, students who may have different dis disabilities or abilities? How are we making space for that in whatever we're creating? And again, how are we being transparent about whatever we expect them to produce. Is that we're giving them a template? Are we giving them an example? Are we walking them through it? Are they working in teams? Just being transparent about those expectations to help them be as successful as possible. Other things that we can do, especially, and this goes for like any assignment where you're using new technology, it doesn't just have to be AI. If you're using something that's new to students, best practice is to have that on the spot tech support. If you're teaching online, you can put it directly on that Canvas page. Here are the places and where you can get tech support or academic support, like tutoring and things like that. Um, or back to that peer-to-peer -peer support, that would be a great place to put it. If you're teaching on campus face-to-face, -face, giving them the access to that tech support, telling them they can bring their device and they can go online and look up questions and answers, or directing them to, walking them to where they can get academic support on campus is huge. Just taking them there so that they can get support. And then adding in some accessibility work and or statements to whatever you're producing, letting them know that you are willing to support them. Where's their DSS or DSPS office if they need support? Um, how can they get accessibility support? So that it's there on the spot because students don't have to self-identify and they may need support and they don't wanna ask you and that's okay. So just giving them that on the spot support when it comes to more technical things like this can be really helpful. Um, so this is just an example of a discussion board that you could create. Um, and rather than making an image description for this, I did actually just make uh, an accessible uh, Canvas page. So you're welcome to click on that link at the bottom. But um, this is a discussion board where students are asked to utilize AI. So they need to ask AI to summarize five main ideas about a particular topic, um, focus, maybe it's an author or a scientist or it's a uh, type of software, whatever it is, they are going to ask AI to summarize, excuse me, five main ideas around that and then pr produce what it is, share it with us. What did you learn from AI? and then critique it. You're learning how to use the thing or learn the thing as you critique what AI has produced. Um, and I just went to a conference a few weeks ago where I chatted with a couple of um, professors who teach in the medical field. And they do something similar to this, which I found very interesting. They do case studies. Um, in this particular case, they were talking about a type of disease. And so they created this like fake profile of a person with this disease, and they ask their students to go to AI and type in all of the symptoms that this person has and see what AI says it is. And then their job was to reflect on what AI came out with to see if whether or not this was accurate, it was aligned with what they had learned in the class, it was aligned with their own practice, if they had any differing ideas. So very similar to this discussion board, asking them to take a look at what AI can produce and then evaluate it against what you know. This is a great opportunity for you as the instructor to see what your students do and don't know yet. So you can use this as a formative assessment to create your final summative assessment later. So in these types of low stakes assignments like a discussion board, you can say, oh, okay, well, they've got this part, but they still don't quite have this. And I need to reteach or reach out to this person 
to make sure that they're understanding it before they get to their final assignment. Uh, so the last part of this discussion board, they have to connect back to an activity from earlier in the week. Maybe this is a hybrid course where they had a lab in person. So they have to connect back to that in-person lab and explain further based on AI's findings and their own findings to come to some common ground. Um, so again, these expectations are very clear. I've created a routine page design and you can see between this page and the page I showed you prior, they're all very similar so that it reduces a little bit of that cognitive load for students, especially when it comes to new technologies and things that are a little bit nerve wracking, like using AI, making sure that like, they always wanna get it right. They don't wanna do it wrong. And so lifting the load a little bit and creating a clear design is very helpful and giving them direct instruction, telling them exactly what you're looking for and possibly providing examples, even as like an initial post or just a uh, sentence or two, uh, possible links to support so that they can get support right on the spot is very, very helpful for them as well. Uh, so this is an example of a possible AI assignment, and it's like a three-step process. This is actually based on Trudy Radke's presentation uh, that I sh shared prior. And I borrowed this from a, a friend of mine who is a professor of English, Emma Rogers. And this is uh, an assignment that she uses where they take um, a focus. So in this case, they're using a, a, a text that they had previously read and they're asking chat GPT to respond to that. And then they go in and they analyze the response from ChatGPT and they put together their own ideas based on um, this particular prompt. So it is very wordy. And I, again, linked it on the slides so that you could take a look and see what it kind of looks like, but we're creating those clear expectations. We have lifted that load with clear page design. And if you're teaching in person, same goes for your slides. If you're using slides presentations, or however you're presenting the information, it's clear. It should be very clear and to the point, very direct, give you that direct instruction so students know what they can, cannot do, and should be doing um, to create the assignment or to adhere to the assignment that you've created. Um, provide them some sample outcomes. What should it look like? Because most of your students likely have not dabbled in AI and they don't know what the outcome should be. The first time I tried to use DAL-E was a hot mess and I had no idea what I was doing and I could not get it to work. And I felt like, wow, I should just quit right now because this is literally my job and I can't figure it out. I can only imagine how a student feels <laughs> who's supposed to be using it for an assignment and they can't figure it out. So provide them an example or a step-by-steps so that they can get there and let them know how you struggled a little bit so that they might be able to get around it. Like I would love to share that story with my students so that they know it's not just them, it's a little bit tricky and here are the things I did to get around that. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons that I use Canvas uh, in a creator because I find it to just be a lot easier. So you can let them know things like that, just be transparent and clear. Um, and consider letting them learn in groups or with peers, because that's a great way for them to learn and retain what they're learning, um, because they're practicing it and they have to share ideas with other people. They have to explain or justify. It gives them just another opportunity to really internalize what they're learning. Uh, and of course, there are limitations of AI detection software. So I, I mentioned we would touch on this and I mentioned that I will also tell you my thoughts and feelings, uh, but this is a conversation that you should definitely be having with your departments, your academic senate, your campus, campus wide to see where everybody is at here because a lot of this has to do um, with student privacy and, and protection of, as well. Uh, but AI detection software as it is, it's based on predicting patterns, just like AI is a pattern creator and responder, the detection software is also based on patterns. So the results are not definitive. In fact, the, the percentage of correct results is so low that I can't even remember what it is right now, but it is very, very low. Um, it is based on reverse engineering of these language patterns. So it's trying to work backwards, but this technology is moving faster than it can move backwards. It's moving so far forward that by the time the detection software thinks it's got it, it doesn't got it anymore. 
Um, it's, it makes it very complicated to keep up with everything. And it's just taking a guess and, and hoping, crossing its fingers that it's getting it right. Um, we talked about biases earlier, but one of those major biases, especially in detection software, is against non-native speakers. And non-native speakers who likely use things like Grammarly or other things to support their proper English use as they learn um, will often mark that as AI generated. Um, and a lot of the times it's their own words. They've just turned to a thesaurus or they've turned to the dictionary um, and it comes out sounding possibly like it came out from AI, but it didn't. Um, so we really have to think about when are we using these and why are we using these? And can we reevaluate our assignments to make them more authentic, more interactive so that we can allow students voice and choice to show us how they learn best, how they know best um, without having to use detection software. And like I mentioned, uh, AI tech outpaces detection software. It's more than 10 steps far, far ahead of the detection software. But we wanna give opportunity for students to feel empowered. We want them to know that we are evaluating their work for, for what they've created. If it's produced by AI, then they're obviously citing it. We are supporting them. We are teaching them how to use this technology so that they can leave the community college space and get into whatever workforce or whatever job, whatever, whatever they want, and know at least a little bit about it and how it can be used or not be used in particular spaces. Um, we know that it's a useful tool and we know that now there are a lot, a lot more jobs that are being created around AI where they have to use it for their job. Uh, there are jobs that are AI period. That's all they do is like use AI all day. I took a ride with an Uber person like six months ago and he's like, oh yeah, I just got a new job at a tech company and all I do is AI all day and then I just drive Uber for fun on my way to work. And he was super interesting. He works for a tech company and it's a brand new position that they just created. And he was able to kind of create the own position around AI because they didn't really know what it would do yet. Um, so how are we preparing students for opportunities like that? A lot of the students who are in my classes are returning to get a salary bump. So they may be 30 years into the tech industry and they want to come back and learn more skills. How are we also supporting those students who are returning to build more skills? How can the use of AI in whatever class that they take support them when they're moving forward into new positions or whatever they are doing? Um, this also gives students an opportunity to know that it is a useful tool they have so many interesting, rich, unique ideas and perspectives that are valuable and needed and AI can't replicate that. If we don't say that out loud to our students, they may not know that their voice has value. They may not know that their opinion is important and they may feel like, oh, AI is so much smarter than me. I, I'm just gonna let them do it for me. But their voice is important regardless of how it gets across and at making them and feel so comfortable and a part of your community can alleviate that need or that desire to use AI if you don't want them to. They need to feel respected and valued in the classroom and know that their voice is so important. Um, and saying that regularly is a really good way for them to make, to feel comfortable and, and to make those strides. Um, so we do, we do have time for questions and I know I have a ton in the chat, so I'm gonna have lots of time. Uh, but I did wanna give you some resources and reminders. Um, so there are the At One Course catalog, which I just saw that there are some summer courses that are available on the At One Course catalog. If you have not taken them, I highly recommend. Um, and some of those courses informed a lot of my opinions and thoughts in this particular presentation. Um, in particular, the Equitable Grading Strategies course, which I would highly recommend, um, where I learned a lot about ungrading and more equitable grading practices to inform my teaching. Um, I have a ton of templates that I have created. Um, I run our peer online course review program at DVC and I created a bunch of templates there rather than like link them all here because Canvas Commons links never work. If you just search for DVC distance education, you will see all of the templates that I've created. A lot of which I shared today are there as well. Um, 
And then consider your aligning, if you're teaching an online course, consider aligning your course to the poker rubric, which is our peer online course review rubric. You likely have a DE coordinator on your campus who knows a lot more about that. Uh, but you are welcome to reach out to me too, and I can figure out who to get you in contact with to get that started as well. Um, and thank you. I, I know I had a few requests for my email. I will put it in the chat right now. And um, do we want to do the close first and then open for a Q&A, or do you want me to do the Q&A now? I think we should do the Q&A Q &A now. Okay, great. Any questions? Nancy, do you mean the recordings for our at one webinars? I'm seeing a couple of questions here. Some I'm not sure are specific to yeah. CVC and at one, but the most recent one, Dorothy asked, what is detection software? That is a Crystal. great question. And I see I see a couple of people um, who commented earlier on it. So detection software um, would be something where you can upload uh, student produced work into it and it would tell you whether or not it has AI, like turnitin.com has one. And it's sort of like turnitin.com in general, if you've ever used it before. Um, the issue you want to consider, and that's why I continue to recommend that you talk about it on campus in your own department or in academic Senate is, um, FERPA compliance, which is your, um, student information privacy act. So you do need to make sure that whatever student information, work, name, whatever that you are providing to these companies is safe and protected. So if you don't have a contract to use those kinds of technologies within your district, you do need to be having that conversation because it's likely if you're using a third party um, software detector that you might have some student information out there that shouldn't be out there. So important campus conversations. I also see a question from Isabella who asks, how can students cite AI in their essays? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, first of all, it depends on like the citation type. Uh, so whether they're doing MLA or APA, but you know, OWL at Purdue has great resources uh, for all types of citations. And they actually just released um, some information on citing AI. So it's, it's out there now. People are getting wind of how to cite it. Um, I don't have, unfortunately, a link to the website that has it, um, and I wish I would have saved it. An instructor just told me about it not too long ago, but it's out there. So I would just highly recommend Googling like Owl at Purdue AI citation, and you'll likely be able to find that. But it's it's coming, and in the meantime, I just asked students to tell me what they asked AI, what is the response, and then give me like a date and time, um, just kind of to get around that. But now that we have more formal ways of doing that, I would definitely um, take a look at that. Does anyone else have additional questions? You can also unmute yourself and ask because the chat does scroll by pretty quickly. I do see that Lisa had a question. Uh, Lisa, the survey has been repeated. We've been posting it in the chat so she can post that more time. So she didn't mind dropping the link to that. Yep, she just did. Yes, it looks like people are providing the resources for citation. Thank you. I knew I should have saved these. <laughs> I will do that now. Tony, do you have a question? Tony, if you could unmute yourself, we see that you have your hand up. I don't remember you saying, you alluded to it, 
but what are what are some you know real basic suggestions for if you don't want your students to use this stuff what would you tell them uh like i mentioned i would be really clear and you give them transparent expectations and tell them why and be very honest around that and give them support on the spot as to how they can get around that right, and get around the, the feel, the need that they have to use AI. I have to be honest, I don't really have much faith in the idea that students will use this responsibly. Um, and if you're trying to teach a class where you want people to use their own minds, this is like the worst technology you could even imagine. And it's not go it's not going anywhere. So I think our opportunity now is that we can teach students how to use it ethically and responsibly. They're not going to learn how to use it unless we teach them. And so this is a good opportunity for us to think about what are our own expectations. And if those are your expectations, being transparent around that and allowing them to be a part of the conversation because their voice is just as important in their learning as ours is. And I would I would say making them a part of it is the best way to get around it and creating a community around that. If you put the policy forward and you and don't allow students to be a part of that, they're not really going to understand why. Um, so just being responsible and reflective and including them in the learning as part of the process is a really great way to build around what's already here. Like, like said in the chat, the boat has left the dock. It's here. Unfortunately, it's not going anywhere. So we really have to figure out how to get around to how to get around what we want. Sherry, go ahead. Um, yes, the more I learn about uh, chat GPT and AI, um, the more I'm coming to think that we need to um, get around the idea that um, AI and critical thinking are incompatible and to get around the idea that it's just a tool for cheating. Um, those are kind of the attitudes in my faculty department. And that's what the way I felt, but the more I look into it and learn about it, the more I think that um, it's a powerful tool. And I agree with everything you said about students are gonna need it to use it in the future. And it's our job to prepare them. So thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Yeah, I mean, it's, something that thoughts have evolved over time, right? We all have different thoughts and feelings and we're all teaching different things and doing things, but the ultimate goal is student success and student support. Um, and I did put my email in the chat again, cause I did see a couple of requests for it in case you missed it, it is in there. I also see a question from Patricia in the chat. It says, I had one colleague share that they make students share their Google docs and they assess their progress in constructing a paper. Students can use AI to start it off, but it should be further developed based on class material and their own thoughts. Would you feel that it is feasible or is it still too controlling and shows a lack of trust towards students? Um, I have a follow-up question. So Patricia, hopefully you're still here. Uh, feasible to do what part of that? To have the students use AI to start off? I suppose feasible in regards to like still fostering or keeping a sense of trust with students so they don't feel like they're distrusted that they're monitored yeah. Um, yeah. with regards to their own capabilities of critical thinking. Yeah, I, <laughs> that's a really good question. I think that a lot of that depends on the community that's been created in the class, right? So like I, I do ask a lot of my students to do process-based things where I want to check in and see. And I could see myself saying, hey, start off with AI, but I want to see your process. And I think it, it depends on how you're grading them, right? Like if it's part of your rubric and you have punitive things in your rubric that like disallow them from getting points because they did this, this, and this, then that creates a different vibe versus I'm just in here making comments, providing support, wondering why you used it here, but didn't use it here. So if you create a document that's maybe more reflective and supports students being a part of their own learning and sharing their own voice and thoughts along with whatever technology they're using, I could see it as being a really positive thing.
And I see another question from Nancy in the chat. There was two that she had, but the most recent one is, is it fair to the student to allow AI to do their work until the final exam if we then lock down the browser and suddenly they... It's rolled off too. Uh, no, I just suddenly, lost. suddenly they have to know what they what they submitted as they yeah. would if they had written it. So I, th I think it speaks this general idea of mm -hmm. we create this environment where they can utilize a lot of AI and these process based tools. Then when we get to the final assessment, we essentially lock them down yeah. and lock them out from a lot of those tools. Yeah, and this is another space for transparency and clarity. And letting them know, like, we've done all of this work and we've had all of this freedom. If you are using a lockdown browser, let them know that way ahead of time so that they're prepared and they know, okay, I'm not going to have access to this material, so I need to study. And teach them how to do that. Teach them where to look and what to look at. And I like your, your statement there, Nancy, we have to find a middle ground. Yes, and being clear with students and allowing them to be a part of that is a really great way to do that. Um, if we are doing this lockdown browser thing, think about maybe offering an opportunity for them to do it that's at much less stakes where they get a practice opportunity in there so that they know what it feels like with a smaller test or quiz. Um, and they can take what they've learned in that small situation into the bigger situation that probably is weighs more heavy on their grade, their final grade. One of Nancy's earlier questions, and see more of a broader mm -hmm. philosophical one, was what is the solution? Do we go back to doing what all three of my daughters had to do, or students who we suspected of cheating to write something in front of us? All three of the teachers apologized while doubling down in middle school and high school kids. So it, it's this broader question of how do we know if students are doing their own work, but also Pandora isn't mm. going back to that box. That's the thing that speaks yeah. to this broader issue of more people doing things like, say, in-class writing or oral examinations. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you wanted to speak to that, Crystal, or yeah. if you I, wanted to follow up or weigh in on that. Yeah, and I see she's got another comment that's very similar. You know, yeah, the lockdown browsers, they're also not going away, and it's something that I again, don't personally use, but I know a lot of people do. But, you know, as for for how do we combat that, I think in, in my mind, my response to that is always authentic assessment. What kind of assessment are we creating? Um, looking at our assessment first will be our best dictator of how we can edit, create, recreate to allow students to be more reflective, more personally reflective in the assignment that they produce. Um, it's hard to say like without a content. So, you know, I'll just pick like in, in English. Yes, there is like a return to write it in front of me so that I know that it's you. But what are they writing and how are they writing it? And what resources are they supposed to use and how are they supposed to cite them? So those specificities of the assignment or the assessment allow us space to either include or disclude AI in that it's it's not going to be perfect the first time that we create an authentic assessment and and try to change things. We we're going to learn from our students who use AI to know okay I don't want to do that next time I need to change this next time because the students were using AI. Having a conversation with your students is a really good way to find out too. Asking them like what would you need or what could I do for you so that AI doesn't feel like an option right now. What do you think I can do to get around it? And then incorporating their ideas in your um, project or assessment or whatever you're creating. I would also leverage the people on your campus who are using AI. Reach out to them. Um, leaders on campus, if you have instructional designers or if you have people who are uh, working towards course design, whatever you have on campus, start having those conversations. That's where the understanding really will begin. And you'll be able to test a few theories in some of your assessments that you create. Other mm -hmm. questions, because I was going to pitch one near direction, Crystal, but I'm with sure. CPC, so I wanted to make sure that one of our many participants in the webinar also had an opportunity to ask questions. I don't need yes. to be shy here. <laughs> so, 
So then I'll, I, I have a question for you, Crystal, huh. that's sure. more immersed in this currently. And that is, what is something that you see that people that are trying to educate others on AI or encourage them to maybe adopt that? Where do you mm -hmm. see them going wrong in their messaging to people that are might be more resistant or reluctant to AI? Yeah. I mean, not everybody has to use it or love it. And like, I'm going to go in and be really honest with that. I don't love it either, but here we are, right? Like, it's not something that I want to use, but it's not going away. And I have to acknowledge its existence um, and then acknowledge the fear and pain with the change that is coming along. And we like, I just remember when I first started teaching smartwatches, everybody was up in arms about smartwatches and how students are going to text each other and cheat by looking at their smartwatches. And like, I never had the time for that. <laughs> I didn't have time to monitor my students' smartwatches. And we got past that. We're just going to have to feel the pain right now and get past it. And, and my response is to build a community around it. Um, so rather than doing like one-off workshops, which I know this is kind of one of those, but building a community around AI and a community understanding on your campus, in your department, as the CBC, whatever, like having a, a communal understanding of what it is and what it means to use it. And people still don't have to get on board and that's okay. And we can acknowledge that, but being a part of the conversation and a part of the community is really important. We had some great department conversations with departments that are very hesitant to use it, but having, they're still a part of our community. And we still want to support them and their students are still using it regardless of whether or not they love it. So we really just want to invite people to have the conversation. We, we can do this. We can create something that appeases our students, that appeases ourselves. And teaching, a little bit of teaching is always uncomfortable. It's a very vulnerable space and things touch on nerves that we don't always want to have touched on. And we just have to confront those fears and acknowledge them for what they are and move forward as a community. I especially like what you mentioned about acknowledging the pain that comes with that. So Chi, I think can speak to this as well. I believe you too, Crystal, of that. There was a somewhat parallel resistance to some aspects of online education years ago. And so this mm -hmm. feels like that elevated. I also have another question from a participant that asks, do you, Crystal, personally have these sample prompts or instructions on how on how a student can use? So for example, how might a student frame or ask a question of ChatGPT so it provides good feedback? I think that question speaks more specifically to the idea of exercises or discussion prompts around prompt engineering. Yes. Oh my gosh. We just did one of these at DVC like last week. We called it pizza and prompt engineering. <laughs> That was one of those where this actually we've dubbed all of April, AI April, and we were building our own community around AI. And so that was one of our practices because how are we expected ourselves or our students to be so digitally literate that they can just write these beautiful prompts, right? We have to practice. We have to learn. We have to start practicing. What do I ask and how do I ask it? I don't have a great like one-time answer for that. And I don't have anything that I give my students. Um, because it's something that I haven't had time to like sit down and create, but I would love to do that. <laughs> um, I think this is a really good spot for transparency yet again, and letting them know, this is how I write my prompts. What do you do? Maybe it's just an informal discussion board or something, but it's like, we're all learning. What do you do? And, and how do you make it go? Because sometimes students are way better at it than I am. And I like to know what they're doing, especially students who like, you know, sit there and they have their little YouTube channel and they do all their things. They're so much quicker and smarter than I am around these things. And so I just, I want to get their opinion. Um, so while you're building your community with your peers, you're also building a community with your students around learning too. Another question we have from Nina is, so what does the future look like for instructors who will not use AI? Same as those who didn't want to learn to do online teaching. Yeah. I, you know, when I, when I first got hired at DVC, it was March of 2020, which like, you know, was a little bit of a turbulent time. I signed my paperwork and then everything closed down a week later. And I was like, oh, I don't even know our campus is. This is fun. But I had, I heard this story like the week before the shutdown of an instructor who took an overhead projector home to do like their online learning stuff with their overhead projector. And it made me laugh and it was cute and adorable. And I hope that they're still using the overhead projector because I loved my overhead projector, but 
there is this like blending of elements, right? Like we have at some point, this instructor realized I have to blend online learning with what I know. And that is cool. They probably did a great job. How can we start that process now? How can we blend in what we know and what we're comfortable with and acknowledge that this exists and acknowledge that it's not going away? Um, you know, I, I don't have, again, I don't have an answer for that. It's all so new that I'm just learning right along everybody and I'm trying to grapple with it and figure it out too. I don't know where that leaves people, but we have to think about now, you know, even four years ago at DVC, only 10%, I think nine or 10% of classes were online. And now our number is somewhere in the 60%. Plus I would venture to say 100% use technology now, whereas that was not the case before. D doesn't matter what technology it is. It could be that they're using Canvas and still teaching on campus, or it could be that they're using Kahoot and teaching on campus. Almost everybody is using technology now. That's a change, but it took a change and it took a drastic change through COVID to make that happen. It's going it, to, it's going to be there. So we have to figure out how we're going to move ourselves around it. And Tomoko's question is, how do your students feel about using AI and doing assignments? Do they say that they learn the subject or content better when they use AI? I actually had student responses and I took them out of here for, for, for reasons. Um, so I will try my best to not like butcher their responses, but essentially a couple of the students, and these came out of my friend's class who used that assignment example that I showed you. Students felt valued and acknowledged in that they were able to use it so they can learn. That was their big thing was like, I have never been given the academic opportunity to practice with it. And I didn't know how to use it appropriately. And so I'm glad that I learned how to use it appropriately. Um, I have not had any student who said like, I've learned so much by using uh, like chat GPT or anything, but I think it depends on how you're implementing it. So if students are using it in support of that process, again, if they're part of the process and learning, then it will lend to more learning because they've had to talk about, they've had to reflect, they've had to ju uh, justify, or they've had to explain whatever they discovered and then pair it against something that they were reading or something like that. Um, ultimately, it, it'll just like we used to ask students to do a web quest or a web search. We're just asking them to do more research and justify their position. And that is not harmful to them learning the assignment or learning the subject. The next question I have here is from Dorothy, who asks, does AI keep information about the students using it? Could I, as a future HR person, look up a prospective employee and ask as to what questions they have asked ChatGPT? Can you repeat that last part again for me one time? Sorry. It's okay. It was, could I, as a future HR person, look up a prospective employee as to what questions they have asked ChatGPT? Um, I think this is a, probably a larger question. You can't look up somebody's search history, just like you can't look up somebody's history of, of questions. Um, I mean, you could you could leverage it as an HR person and help it like fine tune questions and things that you ask people, um, but you can't uh, police somebody's history of their, of their chat. It's all under their login and something that they create. Um, and it does keep like a log as you, the person. So when you log in, you get to see your questions, but you can't see other people's questions. Interesting. And I had a request for if you could share that anecdote about the Uber driver that got the tech job <laughs> on AI because the person would like that example to share with their students. Yeah, I wish I could remember exactly what he did and I 100% can't, <laughs> I feel really bad. Um, yeah, do, I mean, I can type it up and, and send it to you if you want to send me an email, I'll put my email in the chat again and I can try to make it better than I did when I described it here, but um, I'm happy to do that. And um, also, someone asked for a clarification. Carolyn asked, what is AI hallucinations and which AI chatbot hallucinates the least? I don't know the answer to that second question because they all do. Um, I would venture to say, I don't even want to say least. I would say it's less likely to at perplexity only because perplexity provides citations. 
but don't quote me on that. I have no idea. Um, an AI hallucination is like something that it thinks is true. It makes up its own information based on things that it's been fed or things that it makes up out of its own little world. And I think in some ways it's also dependent on what prompt it's fed as well. Yeah. Am I correct mm -hmm. on that one? I yeah. That. And go, yeah, go ahead. No, you got it. Oh, I'm just going to say, like, I've seen, you know, people who are like looking for, you know, case study responses. Well, if it doesn't exist, it'll just make it up because it wants to it wants to give you what you want. Yeah, Jennifer Malin actually brings that up and says some of perplexity citations are not correct. So be sure mm -hmm. to check them when you use it. Similar thing happened with the student assignment that I had where we there it was a deliberate prompt engineering type exercise. So we looked at the citations together and said, well, that's really interesting that this one gave you one set of citations and the other one gave you a different set of citations. Right. I believe like one of them had nothing to do with that or didn't even exist. Yeah. Yeah. So you, and that's part of the learning process. That's one of the reasons that I like Trudy Radke's work so much is because they require students to go back and review everything and check it for accuracy. Trudy is also in one of our participants. So hi, Trudy. Oh, hi, Trudy. Shout out. <laughs> I was, you I was don't know her. I am, but you're awesome. <laughs> she was also very gracious to share some AI materials with me as well. So we, I appreciate you as well. Uh, another question just popped up is, do you know of any jobs that currently require AI? Require? I don't know about require AI, but I do know like there are, I mean, all the tech companies are out there. They are asking people to know these things. They are asking people if they're familiar with these things. Um, like, I mean, I, I don't know of a job in particular, but I have a friend whose husband works at Apple and I know that they regularly use it. Um, there, I see Mark's comment, there is a job of being a prompt engineer. I've seen a couple of like instructional designer jobs come through my LinkedIn email that have AI as a part of it. So I don't know, it's out there. The same, I get those. I, I'm also flocked for ID jobs on LinkedIn, so we're probably <laughs> seeing a lot of the same things. <laughs> uh, to the to your other point, I have a friend that also works with training that AI software. So mm -hmm. there are jobs yep. out there. They're not exactly the best paid ones, uh, but yep. that is a whole other webinar and discussion about how various companies are paying contractors to train up that data. Uh, another question that I saw pop up up is I might have gotten buried there. No, I see that Lauren has her hand up. Ah, yes. Lauren. Go ahead, Lauren. Hi. Okay. I didn't know how to type it, so I thought I'll just say it. <laughs> I heard of a strategy somebody used somewhere um, for students to have discussions with like a celebrity or somebody who's passed away, like a theorist yeah. or something along those lines. And I thought, oh, that would be so cool. I teach child development. And what if they could have a conversation with like Piaget or Vygotsky? And I tried to use chat GPT and they, it said basically they don't have that, that capacity to do that. So I was wondering if there is a particular bot <laughs> that does have that capacity. Cause I just, I think it could be an interesting, I teach a lot online and then some face-to-face. -face. So, but for online, yeah. I think it would be a really interesting thing. Oh I man, know. I will. First of all, that is an awesome idea. And I really, I really like that. <laughs> I'm going to file that away for later. Um, <laughs> I don't, if you haven't given a chance to Google's Gemini, I would check that out. What okay. I found, and this is not like based in science. This is just me. I found it to be like a little bit more creative um, and, and a little bit less rigid than ChatGPT's response. Mm -hmm. But it could also be one of those prompt engineering moments where you start small and say like, give me a summary of Piaget and, and who he is and what he did, and then write it in the voice of Piaget and then do this and then do this. Thomas just said it, train it and feed it what you want. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I also saw someone reference in New York Times article. I don't know if this is the one I'm gonna paste it. Oh. In I read that. Yes, I read about that. Actually, I couldn't even watch the video. So I think it might be this one. And another question I see is, do you know of any AI tools that serve as a tutor for students? I've heard of Khan Amigo, Amigo but do you know of any yeah. others? 
That's the only one that I am familiar with. I know that there are a lot of people out there who are creating their own for their own use. Um, and in that, I would just say, you know, be careful of student information that's collected um, because if you're asking students to go to it, you're also asking them to sign up. So just be wary of that. Um, but I, I don't know of any. All right, do we have any other questions? Because if not, we'll move on to the closing for this webinar. Well then, first off, thank all of you for attending this webinar, especially on a Friday, and especially as we get closer to the end of the semester. While I'm on quarters at De Anza College, I know that all of my, the majority of my colleagues and friends are on semesters. So we know that a lot of people are on empty right now, and we greatly appreciate that. Uh, Sochi, if you could drop the link to the survey in the chat just one more time. So we ask people to complete that. It's, a lot, it's set up to allow you to receive a copy of your responses. So please be sure to click that button that says, give me a copy of my responses. That should serve as the verification if you're using this for flex credit or advancement. If for some reason that's not sufficient, please email support at cbc.edu, which will also be placed in the chat, and we can get you some type of verification. Just please, as always, be patient and give us some time to make sure it's drafted up and proper. Now, we this pretty much concludes the webinar series. We do have one more on online privacy, but after mid-May, the rest of our webinar series will be concluded for the spring. However, Past recordings of the webinars that we've held through between now and February have, are up along with the slide materials. For this webinar in particular, give us about a week to have the video and the recording up. We do need time to make sure that it is properly captioned and accessible. So thank you once again, and please complete that survey because as Sochi mentioned in the opening, we do look over all the responses and use that as consideration for future programming. So if there was a topic that you really liked and would like to see again, or perhaps see a follow-up, or if there's a particular webinar facilitator, for example, you thought that Crystal was amazing and would like to see more from her, if we get enough positive feedback, perhaps we could beseech her to give us more, give us more of her time and do a follow-up to this. I will stop the recording now. I'll linger around for any remaining questions, but have a great rest of your day.